What you're about to see is a real-life story. Taken from the files of the police racket and bunco squads, business protective associations, and similar sources all over the country. It is intended to expose the confidence game. The carefully worked out frauds by which confidence men take more money each year from the American public than all the bank robbers and thugs with their violence. Captain Braddock, ready. This story begins at one of our large hospitals, where not too long ago I was visiting a friend on the force who was recuperating from a gunshot wound. On my way out, I saw a patient being wheeled back to his room from surgery. And two things made me stop for a moment. First, the unusual amount of attention being shown this patient and the presence of a reporter. And second, I had a vague idea I recognized the sick man. If he was who I thought he was, the two didn't jibe. You're Captain Braddock, aren't you? Police Department? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you don't happen to know the name of that patient, do you? Yeah, Nichols. He's a police captain, too. I wanted to ask if you knew him. Nichols? No, not offhand, no. This is my first day on the paper, and I, I want to bring in a good story. But I can't seem to get a word out of anyone in there. I thought if you knew him, you could help me out. How do you mean? Well, uh, I just can't go in with police captain undergo surgery. I've got to have an angle. You know what I mean? Well, maybe there isn't any. Just police captain undergo surgery. No, uh, there must be something. Did you see the attention they were giving him? Two doctors, two nurses, an attendant, and the head of the hospital. If he rates all that attention, he must be somebody special. That's what I want to find out. That's my angle, see? Well, I don't know. I... Harris, Captain Nichols is gone. Is that what you wanted to know? Gone, huh? Was he anyone special? I mean, besides being a police captain. Well, he'd been on the force for quite a while. At least I understand he had. He came here for a not too serious operation, and uh, he failed to pull through. That's about all. Well, why all, all this fuss? Well, you might say that we accorded him the privileges of his rank. I see. You wouldn't talk to me before, sir. You or any of your staff. Is there some reason for this? I mean, is there anything that you couldn't tell me then that you could tell me now? Uh, yes, there was. I don't suppose there's any harm in telling you now. When Captain Nichols came here, he asked to have his presence kept a secret. Secret? Why? He was up for promotion to the rank of inspector. If the department found out about his operation, which of course he was quite sure he'd pull through, they would have removed his name from the promotion list. Uh... As superintendent of the hospital, I saw no harm in keeping his confidence. I'm sure you understand. Uh, you won't quote me, will you? No, I can't use it. It's dead as an angle. Died with Nichols. Yes, I suppose it did. Well, Harris, stop by my office on the way out, and I'll give you the captain's full name and address and anything else like that you might want. Well, that's it. Police captain succumbs, period. I thought, sure, there was an angle here. Something I could toss on the city desk and take a bow for. I'll give you a... Really? I sure appreciate it, Captain Braddock. What do you know about him? Plenty. First, his name was Nichols. Come on over here where we can sit down. Well, here's your story. Nichols' real name was James J. Doyle. He didn't have much schooling, very little as a matter of fact, and he started out working as a plasterer. An honorable enough profession, but one that didn't pay very well for a man with his ambition. But he stayed with it for a long time, wanting to break away into something better, but never able to decide just what. There weren't any higher paying jobs that he could qualify for. Finally, he just walked off the job for good. There had to be something else he could do that would make him some real money. So Jim Doyle pulled up stakes and moved to the big town, where he took up with a small-time car man and grifter by the name of Short Charlie Cooper. But the team didn't click. Short Charlie had the slick exterior and the glib tongue that should have ensured success. 
but he wasn't smart. And Jim? Well, he just didn't have what it takes to make a living out of the rackets. No slick article, he. Nothing smooth or suave about him. Nor did he have the gift, the very necessary gift, of making confidence-inspiring conversation. Come on, Charlie, let's get out of here. No, wait a minute. I think I got something in here. Beat it, beat it. Hurry up. I'm sorry. That's all right. Here you are, Sonny. I didn't drop them. Well, sure you did. No, they're yours. I didn't have any money in my hand when I came out. Well, that's funny. Neither did I. <laughs> Homeless money. How do you like that? <laughs> Tell you what I'll do. I'll toss you for it, okay? Okay. What do you call? Heads. Heads. Heads it is. <laughs> How about again? I've got nothing to lose. For a buck? A buck. What do you like this time? Tails. Tails. <laughs> this must be your day, Sonny. And while short Charlie Cooper worked the old two-headed coin dodge on the sucker, Jim Doyle waited to make his entrance. When short Charlie lost three dollars, Doyle was supposed to stroll by, stop, watch a moment, and then, as a passerby unable to resist a little friendly gambling, get into the game and take the sucker for all he had on him. Say, you two, what's going on here? A cop. What's the matter with you, anyway? There goes three bucks. You're supposed to be nice, friendly, the teeth. Get the guy's confidence. Don't scare him away. Can I help it? A cop. You couldn't grift ice in the wintertime. Now, well, let's go home. Wait till my wife hears we lost again. Well, at this low point in his new career, Jim Doyle should have been ready to go back to plastering. But he still had his eye on the fast buck. And he wasn't giving up yet. Charlie, I think I got an idea for some big dough. Something I can handle without lousing it up. Yeah? What? I just got the general ideas so far. I gotta work it out. Know how to handle the details. But it's there, Charlie. I know it. Just give me a little time. Well, hurry up so I can tell Amy. Hey, we got a beer in the house? I can think better with a beer. Amy, we got any beer? Well, Amy, where you going? What do you think? I've had all of this I can take. Wait a minute, baby. What's the matter? I'll draw you a picture. Tell me, how much have you made since you teamed up with this, this ape? And bringing him in as a boarder yet. Freeloading on us. And sitting around like the world owes him a living. Oh, baby, Jim's all right. He's just finding a little tough to get the hang in the grift. A little tough? Fifty years and he'll never make it. Ha! Get a load of the puss on him. A personality like a dead lock. Never mind about that. I'm working on something good. Yeah, yeah, baby, something real good. Ah, uh, why don't you get wise to yourself? You'll never make the grift. You ain't built for it. Get yourself a job. Any place. If I walk into police headquarters and they'll snap you up, just like that. Amy, just looking like a cop don't mean you can be one. Besides, he couldn't pass the physical. Bad ulcers. That's a tapeworm, brother. And I ain't staying around to nurse it. Look, I tell you, we're gonna do all right. Just give us a little more time. You can have all you want. Don't. That's what I want. When you got it, call me. Baby, you're leaving me flat. Right on your kisser, chum. Well, are you thinking? The beer. Oh. the last of it, so you better work it out.
Well, he is sinking and just wasting the stuff. Thank you. Look, I don't look like a con man, right? No sweet talk, right? Yeah, 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 we know all about that. I look like a cop. Even your wife said it. Ain't that right? What's that got to do with it? What's the gimmick? The gimmick. The smooth guy gets his by using what old nature gave him. I'm gonna get mine by using what the old girl gave me. That's the gimmick. Oh, brother, you're gonna join the force. You can't. You got oats, as you told me. Besides, cops make peanuts. I thought this was gonna be for big dough. Who said a cop? What else could I pass for besides a cop? A jerk, that's for sure. A fireman, huh? Captain Blaney of the fire department. Could I get away with it? Well, in the uniform, maybe. But where does a big dough come in? You run into a burning bank and drag it out, is that it? No, nah, you burn your fingers. My way will be a cinch. Now, get me the phone book. And so Jim Doyle believed he had finally found a use for his own peculiar brand of talent. He was smart enough not to fight his manner and his appearance, but to capitalize on them. The bold front, the authoritative voice, the self-confidence. Whether as Captain Blaney of the fire department, he could build a fat bank account for himself and his partner, still remained to be seen. But he was ready to go to work and try. The heart of the city, was the fertile field Jim Doyle selected to test his innate skill against men of wealth. Men endowed by nature so much more favorably than he. Men whom he hoped to separate from some of their money. The motion picture industry was his particular goal. The offices of the exchanges, the producers of newsreels, sundry short subjects, and others in the film business who were subject to fire laws prohibiting smoking on the premises piling film in office corners, leaving film lying around without approved fireproof containers, carting it uncovered through the halls and so forth. Laws which were often broken in the rush of the day's business. Jim Doyle was up early the next morning trying out his plan. From the list of the film companies he got out of the classified phone book, he selected his first victim and placed a call from the lobby of the building where the company was a tenant. Sanctuary, Phil. Captain Blaney been over to your place? Captain Blaney? Who is this? Fire department. You been there yet? Fire department? Uh, well, no, uh, he hasn't been here. Okay, thank you. Just trying to locate him. Uh, hello, uh, what? Uh, Miss Ridley? Yes, sir? A fire inspector may be here any minute. Uh, get rid of that uh, film there, quick. Uh, you're not smoking, are you? Oh, no, sir. No. Oh, where should I put the film? In the cabinet. Quick, and lock it. Anything else? Quick no, now. I don't see anything. All right, get back to work. Get back to work. Whew. It's not only a fine. I could lose my job. Mr. Abaddon. Yes? But if you want to smoke, go outside. Oh, yes. <laughs> Captain Blaney. Fire department. Oh, yes, Captain Blaney. Uh, your office was looking for you. Uh, the phone right there, if you'd like to. I'll check in later. Fire extinguisher? Uh, yeah, right here, Captain. Uh, had a check just, uh, uh, let me see, when was it? Uh, the day before yesterday, of course. Uh, we have a drill with it every Monday without fail. Don't we, Miss Nibley? 
Yes, sir. There's no smoking in here. You know that, of course. Oh, yes, sir. I know that. <laughs> you mean to say you never smoked in this office? No, sir. Uh, well, not that I recall. Oh, maybe once or twice, but then I realize what a fire hazard it is, and never again is too dangerous. When I want to smoke, I go outside. Yeah. <laughs> What do you keep in here? Oh, that's for stationery, Captain. We keep our stationery in there, don't we, Miss Nibley? Yes, it's a stationery cabinet. You keep it locked, huh? Uh, yes, uh, company books, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, you uh, around here, uh, neighborhood, lunchtime, uh, yeah, Captain? why? Well, I thought uh, there's a new place open down here on 8, and I thought maybe... Thanks. You and I... But I don't eat lunch. Uh, who put up these petitions? Oh, the, the building, Captain, the building. But you told them where they went. Well, yes, I did. Is uh, <clears throat> anything uh, anything wrong, Captain? I mean, if there's any violation that's entirely unintentional, I assure you. If we left it entirely in the hands of the building superintendent, we figured that anything he'd do be well within the law. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps I shouldn't have depended on him completely, but... I know what you mean. Is... Uh, Everything all right, Captain? Well, let me ask you. Anything wrong you know of? Oh, no, sir. Not a thing. Not a thing, is there, Miss Nibley? That's right, Mr. Abaddon. I meant that uh, little black book, Captain. Uh, you made some entries that... Department business. Oh. Confidential. Well, I'll be seeing you. Yes, I hope uh, so. Do you think he's going to report us, Mr. Avedon? He's going to throw that little black book at us. If I'm tabbed for any violation, I'm through. The head office has warned me at least a dozen times. I'm sure he knew we had film in that cabinet. All right, but don't just sit there, get the boy, and have him put the film in the vault. And you see there's no more film brought in here. And, and no more smoke. You go outside when you want to smoke, understand? Yes, sir. Well, Jim Doyle's act went over with a bang. The remarkable thing about it was that it was completely unrehearsed. Just Jim Doyle being himself, letting nature take its course. And it set the stage for part two of the little drama. Uh, that's, uh, some film was brought into the office here by mistake. You know, it's a terrible thing the way some people violate the fire laws. <laughs> you never catch me doing that. <laughs> it's all right, I'm not with the fire department. Well, that's a relief. I'm with the BPORF. Huh? Benevolent and protective order of retired firemen. I just dropped by to pick up a check and thank you for your ad. Uh, ad? Yeah, and the BPORF souvenir program. You know, for their semi-annual affair. Aren't you Mr. Monlux, at me production? No, oh, no, no, no. This is sensory film. I'm Mr. Abaddon. Well, uh, I guess I dropped into the wrong office. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as I'm here, Mr. Abaddon, how about taking an ad in the program? Everybody in the building's getting in on it. Well, I, uh, I don't know. Uh, it was for a worthy cause, not only for the retired firemen, but their families. The widows of the men killed in the line of duty. The organization with a heart, they call it. Well, you see, the firm doesn't have a budget for that type of thing. It, uh, well, I'll be very happy to take your personal check, Mr. Avenue. It's only $100 a page. Uh, that's, uh, that's quite a sum of money, especially right now. I think I'm going to have to pay a stiff fine. A fire captain was just here. Oh, he nipped you, huh? Yeah. Couldn't talk him out of it. No, not this fellow. He's a tough customer. Yeah, some of them are real tough. Are you telling me? Until you get to know him. Now, you take Captain Chuck Blaney, for instance. On the outside, hard as rocks. Inside, sponge cake. If you know how to handle it. Say, Blaney's the one. Do you know him? Chuck? One of my closest friends. Do you think you could... Uh, I mean, uh, it isn't only the money that bothers me. It's the head office. They'd... Why, they'd pack me in sure if I... Well, the BPORF is old Chuck's favorite charity. The real weakness, I'd say. I'm having him over for supper tonight. I, uh, I could talk to him. Say, if you could get him to drop the charges, I'd be grateful, very grateful. You think you could? I tell you what I'll do. I'll make a deal with you for a full-page ad in the program. That way, we'll chalk it up to charity, and all three of us will be happy. Not because we're doing something for ourselves, but for a worthy cause. How about it? Fair enough? Uh, well, uh... <clears throat> well, all right, put me down for a page. Uh, have it say, uh, good luck from Century Film. Compliments of Mr. Herbert Abaddon. 
Uh, yeah, put, put it that way. Well, I'll see you to set up real nice. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the name of the organization again? Uh, you just make out the check for the B-P-O-R-F. B P O R F. That's $100. That was the beginning of one of the most fabulous careers in the history of the canvassing racket. They got so rich that short Charlie never bothered to get his wife back. But didn't anybody ever ask Doyle for his fire department credentials? Very few. One look at him was enough. And once he started his act, who'd question him? But some of them must have wanted proof that the captain would drop his charges before paying for their ads. A cinch. Doyle just came around again, thanked them for their contribution, and ripped the page out of the black book right in front of them. And if somebody wanted to see their ads in the program? How much does it cost to print one up? Mm-hmm. He checked in here as a police captain to keep his identity a secret, not his illness. How long do you work this thing? Quite a few years. And the field was almost unlimited. There are about 50 cities with film districts, and I don't know how many film companies in each, and many other businesses subject to fire laws as well. Like chemical companies and people that make explosives. Yeah, and they were all Jim Doyle's pigeons. He and his partner worked only when they felt like it, spent winters in Florida, California, nothing but the best and plenty of it. Got your angle now? Well, I got myself a feature story, but it's all this on the level. I mean, really. You see this man? Looking for someone? Yeah, 617, friend of mine. Right in there. I'm afraid you're a little late, though. Jim Doyle just passed on. Gone? Jim's gone? Yeah, a few minutes ago. You a friend of his? No, not exactly. I'm Captain Braddock of the Racket Squad. This is Short Charlie Cooper, Mr. Harris. I'll have to take you in, Cooper. It's all right. With Jim gone, I'm through. Funny. I used to think I was a bright boy, that he'd never make the grade. So he showed me. He was the master, all right. Nobody could have stopped him, only... Yes, that stopped him. Even Jim Doyle couldn't fool anybody now. Still here, Harris? Yes, I... I've been talking to a friend, Captain Braddock, police department. Captain Braddock? How do you do? You knew Captain Nichols? Quite well. Oh, that's too bad. Force has lost a fine man. Fine man indeed. So Jim Doyle couldn't fool anybody now, huh? Well, that's the story of James Doyle, alias Captain Blaney, alias Captain Nichols. He's gone, but there are others in the same type of racket today. Not necessarily using the same act, but pressuring people with the same motive. So be careful. Know the person with whom you're dealing. Be sure you have all the facts before you part with any of your hard-earned cash. Something like what you've just seen could happen to you. Closing this case now, or rather the courts will, but there'll be others, because that's the way the world is built. Remember, there are people who can slap you on the back with one hand and pick your pocket with the other. And it could happen to you. <laughs>